Hi everyone. Welcome again to our podcast series, Startups of Today for the Impact of Tomorrow. And in our latest episode, we are going to delve a bit deeper into the world of startups and investors. According to uh, Atomico's State of European Tech report, at the end of 2020, there were 115 VC-backed unicorns in Europe. Less than a year later, that number rose to 202. According to Tech Cabal, uh, four out of five VCs feel that Africa is going to have an entrepreneurial boom. So I think given that in various geographies, investments into startups are on the rise, this is a very poignant topic. And it's also very good for us to have uh, wonderful guests to discuss this with me. So I'm very excited to introduce uh, Philip Gasatura, Country Director for Catapult Africa, as our first guest. So Philip, uh, would you like to maybe introduce yourself and tell us uh, you know, your uh, company, what kind of investments does it generally make? Thanks, Abjit, and thank you for all for listening in. My name is uh, Philip Gassetur, again, uh, the country director for Catapult Africa. Catapult is a uh, Norwegian venture capital uh, company based out in Oslo. And for the last couple of years, uh, we've been investing early stage, particular focus on ocean and climate. Uh, and today we've got investments about 155 companies around the world with 100 million US dollars under man- asset center management. And this year we're launching into Africa. And as Adjit said, we are very excited about what we see happening in Africa. And so we're looking to position ourselves there for what's happening within the ecosystem and investing in companies that are solving uh, problems on the continent. And so uh, today we've uh, started, we're looking at uh, launch launching our program. We do run alongside our venture capital fund, an accelerator program, uh, putting a focus on impact investing. And uh, today we're excited to be here and join you for this uh, podcast. Thanks, Philip. So it'll be wonderful to have uh, a perspective, uh, you know, from the investor side. Uh, and similarly, uh, I'm also very excited to introduce our, our other guest, which is Steve Butterworth, who's the CEO of Neighborly. So Steve, uh, please tell us more about Neighborly and, um, you know, the investors and investments you've received so far. Great. Well, thanks for the intro and, and wonderful to, to be here today. Um, Neighborly is a, a community investment and engagement platform. We help to connect big businesses with large numbers of local good causes. So effectively helping to remove the friction in corporate giving when it comes to donating volunteer time, financial support, and also surplus product. We're sector agnostic, so we work across all types of businesses. Um, but to the extent that you're trying to localize those giving programs, that's not very easy. Um, and we are operational right now across the UK and Ireland. Um, there are about 22,000 vetted local good causes on the platform um, and getting the support of organizations from the, the big supermarket retailers through to large insurance companies, telcos, uh, FMCG and major international global brands. So very much about helping to localize their social purpose, um, but doing that at scale. And one of the key things now, of course, is not just making that connection, not just managing that communication, but then being able to aggregate the data to be able to report on the impact that these programs are having, both socially and environmentally. Um, and obviously, with the rise of the corporate ESG agenda, that piece has become particularly important. But there is a a public facing side to the Navy platform, which is really about telling the human story behind these programs as well, because it's all very well to get caught up in the the metrics, the numbers, the quantification of uh, of these initiatives. But actually, what does it mean? It's kind of the the so what. And it's bringing that that contribution to life, which makes a, a real difference. So. Navely is uh, a business that's taken investment from business angels in the early days to institutional funds more recently with both a Series A and a, and a, and a Series A plus, and we'll be looking towards a, a Series B in the, in the next 12 to 18 months. Thanks again. So I'm very excited for the things we're going to be discussing today. So uh, let's start with uh, with some of the simple things that I think a lot of our viewers would be uh, you know, interested in. So Philip, maybe I'll start with you. When your fund looks at investing in startups, is it just simply, uh, you know, the basics, um, as people would assume, is, you know, their financial health? Is it is it the, the product line? Is it the innovation that they are bringing to the market? Or is there something else? Like, what exactly do you look for when you're looking at a startup? 
I think because of the nature of our investment, because we are very early stage investment, um, we tend to look at the founder, the founder of the team uh, and the market fit. Does the team understand the market? Do they understand um, how to navigate within this industry? And so do they have history in this, in, in, in this industry? So that we tend to look at because uh, early stage, the businesses are going to be pivoting quite a bit. And so you are really taking a, uh, a long bet on, on the team. Um, that they're going to actually not be able to navigate uh, through this uh, terrain. Beyond that, I think we then do look at the product. Is it something that the market does uh, want? Uh, or is it just for a small market? What's the kind of market size, the scalability? Um, and because of where we are, we're looking at the impact. If this, if this had the, did have the scale it uh, did, uh, did reach, what would the impact be? Um, and uh, that's what we tend to look at uh, from, from a, an investor point of view. I think finally, we, one of the things we look at is what's our additionality? If, they, if we invested in them and they went through our program, would there be any additionality to what we would provide? Is this something that we have the expertise to be able to do? So those are the things that we sort of cross our T's and dot our I's on to see if there's something that we like to, uh, the team that we like to invest in. So I'm going to ask you to maybe go back in history, you know, either uh, when you, uh, you're now currently with Catapult or even before, the startups which were good cases and startups which were not so good cases like what is it that startups did right when they were looking for investment and what is it that startups could pay more attention to i think well, one of the things uh particularly again i speak in this one point of early stage investment because uh, most venture capitalists are looking at uh, investing in early stage would look at many hundreds of them uh, would go into a portfolio those that really um, make it, I think, is in how they communicate. Well, what are they? What's their story? What's their impact? Does, does the team have a belief in where they're going? Um, and that, that's really what we are, we're looking at. Um, I think it's uh, Abraham Lincoln had once said that a compass will tell you that that's uh, that that's the north, but what it won't tell you is between here and there. There's a river. There's a mountain. There's a valley. You've got to navigate that. And so you're looking and saying, does the entrepreneur, the founding team, that are they able to communicate what the North is quite clearly? And are they you're really looking and saying, is this a team that's going to get you through there, pivoting through this, uh, this, this journey that you're going to get on? Because I think it, it really is a journey that, that you're going to be getting on with, 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 a, with a startup. Those that didn't were those that were not able to communicate that clearly, and it was really fuzzy. Um, the idea is there, but communicating how... Also, in terms of who their customer is, um, why, and is this customer in the hundreds or thousands? Is this something scalable? I think that that's one of the uh, the things that we've seen that those that didn't uh, that we didn't uh, end up investing in, and and a couple of those that we've invested in in, in Europe, but also in Africa, where I, I speak to, is those that were able to clearly say the kind of scale that they're able to do get on who their team is. The team is quite very it is important. Is this the team that will help you scale? Um, uh, through that journey that you're about to get on. Great. So, Steve, uh, uh, if I could ask you on the topic of, of, you know, the founder and the team as well, what has been Neighborly's journey right from from starting uh, uh, to where, you know, now that they have you as the CEO in terms of how has been their uh, journey in terms of the founder, the team, and also how they have, uh, you know, communicated with investors? So I'll echo quite a lot of what Philip's just shared from, from our side of the board table. Um, and I'd be interested to hear a bit more from Philip around sort of what classifies as a, an early stage investment in terms of is it pre-revenue? Uh, is it is it loss making, but making revenue? Is it profitable? Because obviously that that becomes an important part of any investor's investment criteria, um, you know, which will obviously govern the you know, their, you know, their sort of target audience, if you like, in terms of who they want to invest in. But from Nabley's perspective, the business was incorporated at the beginning of 2013. The founder had come from a, a marketing agency background. He'd had the idea for, for Nabley off the back of having done what Nabley does, but offline. So he had been looking at how to help the lower performing end of a business's estate. So let's say it was a supermarket chain, he might take the bottom 10% performing stores and help them become more uh, profitable and, and better performing. Um, and one of the, re the ways that he realized you could do that was actually ingratiating yourself to the local community by supporting them. So being an invested 
corporate uh, citizen, if you like, in that community. But really hard to do that when it's not online. And so Navely was was born as a result of that that idea. And in the early days, he got investment very traditional ways. He got money from family and friends. He got money from um, a very early stage business angels. Um, and that was over a, a number of rounds between 2013 and, and 2016. So business, business raised in round numbers about three million pounds sterling over four different rounds over that time period. And um, during that time, to his credit, the, the founder decided that actually he probably wasn't the right person to, to lead the business forward. And, and as, as Philip will attest, there's a very different skill set going from startup to scale up. Um, and I'm sure he has many a story of, of working with management teams that have sort of struggled with that, that adjustment. And while I'd say the business was still very early stage when I got involved, it was definitely at the point when it probably needed to put in place more processes and procedures. It needed to be structured in a way that meant it could scale so that there was repeatability, there was maybe better de defined value proposition. And and so from my perspective, I came in very much with a view to saying, well, what do we need to put in place to help us get to the point where we can go out and, and raise money from an institution, i.e. let's go out and do a, a series A, even if it's a small one. But of course, having an institution on your cap table rather than just family and friends and business angels really validates the, the value prop as well, because there's a level of confidence then to all the points that Philip just mentioned around the team that's going to deliver it. And I would absolutely agree with him that when it comes to backing management, that needs to be from the get go front and center, because that's where all the communication piece is going to come from. And that relationship between investor and investee is obviously critical. And we'll talk more about that later. But from the point of view of being able to then um, bring on board that that third party investor, you know, that value add piece becomes critical as, as well. And, and we found through our fundraising process that that value add was a really important part of our selection criteria. Um, we were fortunate enough for our our investment process to be competitive. So we had multiple investors wanting to, to invest in the company. And there's multiple things that you take into account during that, that process. So one interesting point, and I say interesting, uh, for me, I would say it's an emotional point. Uh, this is probably one of the reasons why I haven't started a startup, although I have many ideas, is because I just feel, you know, to be emotionally invested in, in a project like that, is from the point of view of founders, some of our viewers will be founders, um, knowing at what stage or gauging, you know, what stage their idea has now become into a business is now at the stage where it needs to expand or scale. And, you know, it's it's taken a life bigger than them uh, and that they probably need, you know, uh, other people, uh, sort of diverse expertise to sort of come on board. So maybe, you know, from, from your experiences, I, I would ask the two of you, uh, I, I'll start with Steve, like, what would be a recommendation to founders who are listening in to, to manage that sort of emotional decision? It's a great question. And I think it actually is something that is just as relevant in the scale up phase as it is in the startup phase, even if the founder has stepped into a different role, and you've got a, a new management team in place. And for me, it's very much around making sure that you've got the the right people around you. And um, you know, the, in my experience, successful startups generally are not the doing of one person. Um, you know, it is a team effort, and it's really important to be able to self reflect as a as a leader in a business and know where your strengths and your weaknesses are and, and what are the gaps that that need to be plugged to to make sure that you've got the full complement of skills that are going to help steer that ship in the in the right direction and, and get to the other side the the individual that i think sometimes um not gets overlooked necessarily but doesn't always get quite the recognition as to how pivotal they can be is the chairperson and i would say to any founder even if it's in an, in an unofficial capacity Having a having a, a chair that can be there as a sounding board, who's been there and done it, um, who's got scars on their back, um, especially when it comes to managing investor relations, and I'll come back to that in, in just a moment. But that that individual, I believe, plays a, a really pivotal role in the success of a, of a business, regardless of how early stage it is. 
And and to Philip's point around governance, obviously, as that role gets formalised and becomes official in a in a chair capacity, that they they're obviously ultimately there to to handhold and ensure that governance piece is is maintained, is formalised. Um, I've I've seen a uh, you know, investor relations go bad when the chairperson doesn't do that role well because the founder is an emotional being. We we all are. Um, but it's their baby, and you need someone to have a steady hand on the tiller. It's if the founder is the captain, and I think the the chair is the admiral, who's on the shore often, not always on the boat, um, but can provide advice and can can help sort of steer uh, that captain in the right direction. But when it's back to what Philip was saying around, I absolutely subscribe to the same philosophy. You should never surprise your investors with something you knew about. You know, I would always share bad news pretty quickly, if for no other reason than my investor is probably going to have a view and have an opinion and may be able to help. Um, and, and I think the chair needs to be able to, be, to play that role of greasing the wheels between management and investor. Um, and that really helps to smooth the way. And so I would never underestimate the value of a good chair in a business of whatever size. And Philip, similarly, what would be your advice? I, I couldn't agree more with, um, with uh, having the role of the chair. And I like the analogy of an animal uh, to the captain. I think for, for uh, to, to echo what Steve said, the, the teams, and recently I've, uh, I am I'm a football fan, and, and, I, and I, I like the analogy of how coaches are managing their teams. And it plays out directly on the field, being able to uh, move from the startup to the scale-up. The kind of teams, and you see them transition from when they've gotten through the first quarters or so, and they're into the second half or from the first half. You see the kind of level of management, that kind of skill, for, so for a startup, I think it would be uh, more around the kind of team they bring on board when they need it, um, having that chairman at the, or board at board as well, being able to say, this is where we're weak in, being able to find that resource. Sometimes even for the startup, the founding team, they, they may not know who, who to bring on. Um, uh, and so having that relationship with the investors, being able to bring them on board at a certain time helps steer that. So to me, that would be critical for startups knowing um, when to bring on someone else and i think here in uh, where, where i live there's a local saying which says a, a where a short man reaches that's where he stops if you're in the elevator and all you can reach is a third floor that's where you're going now it is either you find shoulders to stand on to get you to the 15th floor but knowing where to where where that uh, where the help is that you need is critical on bring board to the success of the company great so that's a great analogy and i want to actually move to a similar topic which is slightly emotional as well, but actually very much driven by hard facts. Uh, and I think that's where there's, uh, it would be interesting to get the perspective from both sides, which is the issue of equity when you're looking at investments. So from a starter point of view, Steve, like, uh, you know, a startup is looking at investments, yes, for all the reasons that we've been discussing, but that means giving up a percentage uh, of the ownership. Um, and what are the things that startups generally sort of think about uh, when making that decision? What are the things that they should sort of think about, I would say, in the long term and the short term? Like, what would be your advice there? So I'm, I'm not a financial advisor. Uh, so I, I caveat everything I say here by saying you know, I've been on the, the receiving end of these negotiations between investors and and investee companies, but you know, the reason you have a, a shareholders agreement is so that it is is very clearly set out as to what the rules of engagement are when it comes to the voice of the of the investor in the business. You know, how much input can they have? Uh, and the key word for me is control. Actually, what can they force a startup to do? Um, and so, I would always be very keen on having good lawyers to help you in the first instance for both sides, just to make sure that the playing field is established in a way that everyone is going to be happy with it. And everybody understands everything from, let's call it called consent rights. Do I have to ask permission for for, for me to, to do something, whether that's employing a, an individual on a particularly high salary or whether it's to do with bringing in other institutional investors? Um, and I, I think for me, it's very much around making sure that you understand what you're giving up when you're giving away equity, equity is very easy to give in the early days because you, you, it's very difficult to raise debt because you can't service it because you're not making money. Um, but it is, I'd say, something that you should 
be as frugal with as possible uh, as circumstances allow, because the more equity you can hold on to for longer, as long as it's not at the ultimately at the expense of the business, and therefore it is a very delicate balancing act, uh, but it is a case of making sure that you can hold on to it as for as long as possible, because the minute that control changes, that dynamic in the boardroom is very, very different. And I'm sure Philip's got much more experience than I have, having sat on many boards and invested in many businesses as to the importance of that relationship for all the reasons we both you know, we both discussed around communication and expectation management. But when control changes, that can play out in a very different way. So, so Philip, I'm going to ask your opinion as well, but but to add on from the investor point of view, is taking equity um, just a financial decision? I don't think it's just a financial. It's, it's also a question of risk because um, there's a risk reward in, in this one here. And again, in the judgment of uh, when we're making investment, um, as we review, a lot of the boxes may be ticked but there's some certain aspect that may not be taken. So we feel that, look, this is a risk. And so if there is a risk in this thing that we don't see a mitigation, therefore they will be looking at negotiation to increase um, our, our stake in that one. But really what we'd like to see is that, again, the the, the entrepreneur, the founding team is is in control. And yes, to, to see the point, yes, within that, there should be certain uh, clause within the shareholders agreement or the investment agreement that, trigger well what 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 are certain things that boundaries within which the uh, the team can work because we typically like to see that they get to a series a where at least the founding team combined has at least 50 percent because when you do the economics after that they're getting so diluted and you that it you the the their vested interest after that if they're below that um you you don't you're not sure if they will stay the course and so you typically like to see that they get to that point and so um, I, I agree, uh, agree that uh, entrepreneurs should be able to bring that, to the, hold on to much as, as much equity as possible. Uh, we have seen in the past a lot of uh, uh, sharks that come and eat a lot before before a Series A, and you're wiping out, diluting the entrepreneur. So those are typically what we see as those that we can't get in because it, it really dilutes the, the founding team so much that you're not sure that they're going to stay, uh, to stay the course on this one here. So... We are very lucky with the, with the two guests. One of the points that is becoming more and more uh, commonplace is around ESG, uh, around sustainable development goals. Uh, but you know, to actually put it in one word, it would be around impact. So as an investor, Philip, if I may ask you, what is impact for you? And is it something which is important when you look at investing uh, in companies? And, and if it is important, how do you measure like businesses with more impact versus businesses perhaps with less impact? Thanks, Abjit. I think impact is what's at the core of what Catapult do, because um, even what we, the kind of companies we invest in, uh, our thesis looks broadly at the kind of companies we're going into. If we back them, what's the kind of impact they would have on uh, society, on on people, um, on on their on their economies? Uh, particularly here in Africa or wherever they are in uh, across across the world, and so we're we're not a profit at all costs. For us, we certainly believe that uh, it is um, profit because of impact, and there's a space for that. Um, this is what we're seeing uh, even from a lot of the assets under management that are looking uh, across the, uh, the globe that have now moved to 50 trillion. I think the last I looked at of uh, assets under management that are really pushing for ESG. In our, in our focus here, we're looking at the kind of teams that understand uh, the impact of what they're doing, the solutions they're bringing to their markets, uh, whether that be in alternative proteins, whether that be in uh, new ways of doing irrigation, whether that be in ways of doing uh, new insurance to uh, to micro uh, societies, to in terms of micro insurance and micro financing. There's a whole range. Now, we don't have one lens that we look at it uh, for each company. I think each company has a certain lens and the KPIs for each of those companies would be really rather different. But the, the ultimate goal is how do we bring together people, talent, and capital to change things? And that's what, that's what we're uh, sort of uh, excited about. And we're seeing a lot of these kind of companies show, uh, show up in, across the world. So that, that's our focus uh, as Catapult. So Catapult has a very explicit uh, aim towards impact and you know investing in companies uh, on that aspect. But as founders and as, as startup sort of teams, 
if they meet investors which may not explicitly have the word impact uh you know that's important for them is it something that they should still in your opinion uh keep in mind because maybe it's subconsciously becoming more you know important for other investors or or, or maybe not i think having it again some of the companies we see when they when we come to invest in them or they go through our program may come in not even having an idea of what the impact is and so through our program there is particular focus beyond just the finance and the scaling is impact so they can start to see themselves and what their impact and role would be on society where they are in their markets and so that to us is where we with the additionality that catapult provide to to these companies but i think with uh, as i mentioned earlier there's a growing not just from policy and regulation but even from the consumers and the citizens around the world are are sort of driving and steering their uh, the brands that they buy purchase from the uh, their their financial institutions so there's a wave towards this impact so the the sense of profit at all costs is is no longer uh, it's, it's no longer in vogue I would say but there's more demand from from consumers and one we look at is even in from insurance how do you get insurance from uh, from your growers who are going your cocoa and your coffee um uh, from brands those are the kind of things that we're seeing and so i think for a startup knowing that as they get into this space uh what they're doing is what's the purpose beyond just the profit what's the purpose of the of uh, of the organization that you're starting out thanks for that so steve uh, like i think with with neighborly they were very you know clear from the beginning about their purpose uh, and about their impact perhaps uh, uh, you know it would be great to get that confirmation from you maybe i'm wrong but uh, what about other startups is is it something that's important for them or should be important for them i think the rise of the responsible business agenda has helped to make sure that whether you're an impact focused organization like navely is so obviously we are very we very much are putting local impacts at the heart of responsible business um that's not to say it's right for everyone um it's about how do you make sure that in the way that you take the decisions as to how you run your business you are doing it in the best interest of all stakeholders and by that what i mean is it's not just your shareholders but it's going to be your employees it's going to be the communities where you you operate it's going to be your suppliers it's going to be the planet and that wider stakeholder capitalism narrative is starting to to play out and i think it's more about how do you we you know, work out what's the right way to do that and that's why so net nably is one of the uk's founding b corporations um we're also signed up to the, the united nations global compact um and it's those sorts of frameworks that can sort of help steer a founder as to what are the areas i need to be concentrating on and focusing on to make sure i'm running my business in a in a responsible way and the fact is it's good for business you you attract the right staff you retain staff i mean these are massive costs that you can't get wrong and long term the the ability to be able to grow a business sustainably means you're going to be you're going to be here for for years and i feel like there is it's all too easy to to burn out and and fade away if you just literally put your pedal to metal and want to just try and make money at all costs the the reality is you need people around you and do the right thing you'll keep that talent you'll 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 win business where because of who you are and how you run that business rather than it literally just being about that quarterly bottom line and the incremental growth so you know, when it comes to to impact you know, there obviously are businesses that are taking it uh, to the next level I, i know investors who actually ask their executives uh to look at remuneration uh alongside delivering a certain level of impact as well and um I'm not I you know, I'm 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 a fan of that idea because it it means that you've got skin in the game to to make sure you're you're doing it the right way but I think now it's not about impact investing in perhaps the old sense of how it was defined as probably on the kind of different different way of putting it but sort of the fluffier end of the investor spectrum this is very real So as they say uh you know if you find the right match uh you know, you are in the right relationship between the startup and the investor but sometimes it's time to uh move on and that's the process of exiting so uh, perhaps you know to to conclude our discussion I'd also sort of like to discuss what are the things to keep in mind if the relationship is going well what would be the right uh kind of exit so philip I, i'll start with you in your opinion as the investor 
Earlier on, I mentioned the relationship between a startup and uh, an investor is almost like a marriage. The only difference, right, with this one is it's not till death do us part, right? Um, so th this one here, everyone coming on needs to set clearly where they got on the bus or the ship and know where they get off. And some of them, some investors, for them, the, they'll, they'll know that this is the price or this is the point at which I get off. And some of those will be, I get off at Series A or Series B, or some others will get on. Uh, some of you get new passengers to who say, I'll, I'll go all the way to the IPO. And I get that's a journey where each one needs to know where they get on and off. But it's clearly setting those expectations um, that happens with, to, to know where, when we get to our north, at which the point the investor gets on or off, even sometimes the entrepreneur, this is it. And from the beginning, those mechanisms need to be clearly stated. Um, and so that, that's why I think it's quite critical. So um, because also some investors know that this is where my value addition comes to an end. For instance, our side, where, where we are early stage, we typically will go up to Series B um, in, in some of the companies. And the, the best that I see in early stage investors are those who have networks that are able, as I mentioned, to say, all right, I get off here, but I know who can come on at this point here, and I pass on. And so that, that's, uh, that to us is quite clear in terms of agreeing what the process is for exiting and knowing where each one uh, gets on and gets off. So if, if I understand correctly, one of the elements is to have that clear expectation setting between the two. But the second thing, which is also interesting, what you mentioned, Philip, is that also helping them uh, with the advice and the introductions, if it's your time as the investor to get off the bus uh, with uh, with new passengers who might be getting on the bus at that stage. Um, and, and, and Steve, like, what would you say in your opinion, especially for startups? Philip's you know, encaptured it. It's communication, it's timing, it's planning. Um, and you get those three things right. And there's no reason why the, the relevant passengers can get on and off the bus at the right time. And it's all pretty seamless um, as long as everyone understands their role along the way. Again, no one likes surprises on either side of the board table. But certainly from, from my perspective, again, it, these things take time. And if you were going to be running a, a, a fundraising process going into Series B, I'd be courting people 12 months out. You know, the best time to raise money is when you don't need it. And, uh, and to that end, I've always found that if you've got those early conversations going and you know that there are potentially going to be investors that have been on your cap table for a while who want to get off, they want to know what's coming. They want to be able to pre prepare as well. So have, have a plan. And while, as the saying goes, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, they, if you've got a plan, you can, you can change it. If you've not got a plan, then you're, you're back to your boat analogy and just not having a tiller. So to that end, I think I've always found that if you are you know, on, on track, you've got a plan, you've got the milestones you need to hit, everyone knows their role. It's, a, it's an easy relationship to continue to, to manage over time. Great. So I hope uh, from our discussions, our viewers have got some useful tips, uh, you know, what to keep in mind in the relationship and the journey between startups and investors. To all our viewers, uh, I hope you found the discussion useful. And if you'd like to listen in to our future episodes, make sure you subscribe uh, and you get notified when our new episode drops and you get to listen to wonderful stories such as this one in the future on other topics related to startups of today for the impact of tomorrow. I'd like to thank my two guests, Steve and Philip, for coming in and sharing their stories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Copyright 2022 PWC. All rights reserved. PWC refers to the PWC network and or one or more of its member firms, each of which is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com forward slash structure for further details. This content is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.